Hey there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. One of the reasons that I love making this podcast for you every week is because I know what it's like to feel like you're not quite in the right place. I mean, people are nice and I love my friends, but I have a different connection with other artists. When artists get together, they light up. Normally shy or introverted people suddenly become animated and hard to shut up. That's how I know I've found my tribe. You know what I mean, right? It's like Helen Marr said in an iTunes review. When I found this, she says, it made a world of difference. Now I feel in touch again with artists. I have my peeps and they are here. First off, thank you so much, Helen Marr. And as I hope you've discovered from this podcast, you most definitely are not alone, even if it feels that way sometimes in your studio. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to push your paintings to the next level and discover how to confidently share your voice with the people who are waiting to hear it. And that's just from listening to the podcast. At least that's what people tell me. You can get even more when you join the Savvy Painter email list. When you sign up now, you get essential tips for artists, a free PDF filled with inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It is that easy to join us. Jane Davies is my guest today. Jane is an abstract painter working out of her home in Vermont. In this episode, Jane talks about transitioning from a ceramic artist to painter and then how she licensed her work for commercial goods. Eventually, Jane got tired of doing commercial work and focused on painting for herself and teaching workshops. And Jane shares how she started teaching and how she built up her workshop circuit into a profitable business. We also talk about what she's learned from her students, how she uses critiques to improve her classes, and also different ways that artists learn. So here is Jane Davies. Jane, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm delighted to talk with you today. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Tell me a little bit about when you started painting. I'm interested if there were any artists in particular that inspired you to start painting. There weren't. I mean, there aren't particular artists. I think, you know, like most things, as one's taste gets more sophisticated by doing art, your taste in painters and your favorites kind of tend to change and morph. So yeah, it kind of happened gradually. I didn't, I didn't suddenly feel inspired to be a painter. Was there any, I'm always curious about this, that, you know, like I know that a lot of people love to paint as children, but at a certain point Mm -hmm. you sort of make a decision that you're going to do this and this is going to be your life's work. Do you remember ever specifically making that decision or was that something you always knew? I've always made things. And as a kid, I was always into all kinds of craft things. And I had an inkling that I would find my way in that mode. And in my early career, I was a potter. So I went to college. I Then I went back to school to learn ceramics. And then I was a potter for 15 years. And then that morphed. Let's see, how did that morph into painting? I took a watercolor class sometime in the early 90s. And it really grabbed me. So my pottery changed. I went from throwing pots and putting a lot of attention into making the tableware. It was what I was doing. And I switched from that to buying bisqueware and painting on it with ready-made ceramic colors. And that just felt like cheating. (laughs) Wait, you changed to buying, what did you call it? Bisqueware? Bisqueware. So that's like ready-made dishes at those paint-your-own-pottery places. They have these white pre-bisque fired dishes and you paint on them. So I decided that's how I was going to do my pottery because I, I was having way more fun painting than actually making the, making the pottery. And so it felt like cheating, but in fact, I was just a better painter than a potter. And I just started doing a lot better. And I was very candid with my, my clients about how this work was made. It was, I was doing decorative painting on ceramic surfaces. Uh And then I wrote a book about that and bailed on that in favor of licensing my designs, my painted designs to manufacturers of ceramic tableware, but a lot of other products as well. So there was a little bit of overlap there, but then I was a freelance artist for 10 years and that involved painting and then 
putting things together for products. Interesting. So you just at a certain point felt like you were having much more fun painting rather than doing the pottery work and the decorative work and the licensing? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. I mean, as a potter, I decided painting was more fun. And so I switched over to painting pottery. And then from there, that got to be pretty much too repetitive and limiting. So I started licensing my designs to manufacturers and moved completely away from doing ceramics at all. And so for 10 years, I was painting designs and licensing them to product manufacturers. And that was ceramics and paper goods and stationery and rugs and home furnishings of all sorts and um, all kinds of stuff. So that was kind of interesting, but it was painting on paper for products. Right. Yeah. And then at some point I realized that I had no idea who I was as an, as an artist because I was always painting designs to be manufactured on a product. And I had written a couple of books in the meantime about collage and about art, even though I didn't have all that much experience with it. And I had, I'd always done some painting and printmaking and stuff during the winters, which were kind of my off season during my career as a potter. So this was kind of building up in the background. And finally, with the licensing work, I just realized that I didn't like it anymore. <laughs> it was just too frustrating because I do all this work on spec and then you never knew. I never knew if I was going to really get a licensing contract or not. And so the work was very unpredictable. And yet I was putting an awful lot of effort and time into it. So how is that different from painting? Well, fine art is completely different because every piece is a different thing. I mean, you don't know how it's going to come out. It's not for a product. It's just for itself. It has its own. I mean, each piece has its own demands and its own life. So it's a one of a kind object. Yes. Yes. No, I was actually just I was curious because people have joked with me about that, that this is the, the ultimate painting is sort of the ultimate kind of well, creating on faith. So you were saying that when you were doing that work, that you were doing it all on spec, and you never knew if it was going to sell. Mm -hmm. And as painters, it's very similar. You work really hard on a painting for X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And there's no guarantees. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, in that respect. Yeah. I mean, all my painting is on spec, but I get such personal satisfaction and growth out of that process. And to me, that's much more valuable than selling a painting. But I don't make a living on selling my paintings. <laughs> I mean, I make a living on teaching. So so there's a really good balance there. And so I kind of honed my skills of just the materials in that in that world of, of doing the freelance art. Mm -hmm. Because I was painting a lot of stuff and then photoshopping it to death as well. Uh, because, you know, I, you paint like individual things and scan them all and then put them together in different kinds of layouts and stuff. It was at a, finally I was spending about 99 percent of my time on the computer. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty common with the with the licensing because you have to change it for plates, for cups, for, you know, everything yeah. is completely different and you can't just yeah. do it once. Yeah. And it was sort of interesting because during the time I was in that world, I mean, I started in around. 2000, I think, or maybe 1999, I'm not sure, somewhere around then. And the digital stuff wasn't as common then. So people were showing at the trade shows, you know, hand painted artwork. And then I kind of kept showing hand painted artwork. And then I realized I just needed to learn how to manipulate it in Photoshop. Mm. Anyway, so it was a good, a good skill set to learn. But yeah, I mean, there wasn't really, there's not a whole lot to be gained by by doing a whole lot of designs that are um, laid out on in Photoshop or on the computer and then not getting anywhere with it. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, the thing. <laughs> that would be frustrating. <laughs> yeah, but doing a whole lot of paintings and, you know, they might sell, they might not. It's the work and the process and the practice that is valuable to me. And if I care whether it sells or not, if I'm trying to make pieces that will sell, the work falls flat. Mm -hmm. It absolutely does. I can't do it. Some people can. But yeah, I have to really just be super honest and true to my own path when I paint, because otherwise, <laughs> it's, it's just going to look like a copy of something or it's going to look sort of self conscious or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or contrived. 
something like that. Yeah, yeah. It just gets, you know, it's not real. Yeah. And I think whether or not people can identify it or not, they know something's off. Exactly. And I think I think you're right. I mean, the, the key there is people can't identify what it is. But if the piece falls flat to me, it's going to fall flat to my viewer. Yeah. You know, people have different tastes and you never know. But I don't want to put something out there in the world that isn't that doesn't feel like like mine. Right. Yeah. So I know people sometimes I mean, I know artists that complain about how the galleries want them to make the same thing over and over again. And so they do. And God, just shoot me if I ever do that. Just I can't. I mean, I made production pottery for 15 years and I made, you know, I painted for manufacturers for 10 years and kind of going back to anything that feels like just making a product isn't going to fly for me. So Mm -hmm. and I don't mean to be critical of people who are making paintings to sell and kind of know how to do a certain kind of painting and can bang them out. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I was doing as a potter and also as a, as a freelance artist. And I've just had enough of it. (laughs) You know, I mean, people that come from a different kind of background, there might be some excitement in that. And so I don't mean to be critical of that practice. It's just for me, I feel like that would be a step backwards because I did so much of a kind of predictable and production kind of work. Right, right. Where do you get your inspiration from your paintings? What is it that fascinates you and makes you want to go and sort of attack a canvas? Sometimes it's other people's work. (laughs) And I haven't done this in a while, but I have occasionally surfed through Pinterest just to find artists that I don't know. And then, you know, kind of go ogle their websites or artists that I do know or artists whose work I've seen in a gallery or a show and then go to their websites to see more. And I have to admit, I don't get out as much as I would like to, to go see art in the flesh because I live, well, I live in a rural area, so you got to drive anywhere, but so I'm not like in a metropolitan center where there are places to go to look at art. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is I'm just teaching and traveling a lot. And I'll say too much because I'm missing the opportunity to, and the time to go be a consumer of art as much as I'd like. So it is largely other people's artwork, you know, that I need to sort of see on a regular basis just to kind of feel like in community or see what other people are doing and and be inspired to continue what I'm doing. And then the other thing is just ideas that, that show up in my teaching. And that can be in ideas of students or ideas that I come up with or see what a student does with a certain kind of assignment. And so I feel like I'm with other people making art a fair amount because of the teaching. Mm-hmm. That kind of keeps it fueled. Yeah. Yeah. Now I find that we need community. We need to be around other artists, even if we're not painting together, just mm-hmm. to share their ideas and, you know, be around somebody who gets it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think there, there's different conversations that happen. And when those don't happen, it gets, I don't know, there's a hole. Yeah, exactly. And I do feel it with teaching. I mean, I need the teaching to fuel me as, as much as I need to look at other art and as much as I need to be in my studio painting. And that's part of it. It's like it's being in community and painting with other people and seeing what other people are doing. And so, yeah, I'd say my students are pretty inspiring. Yeah, it sounds like it. Can you tell me, was there a moment or a decision that you made that you feel like looking back was pivotal for you or was sort of a personal success? Yeah, I think that was the moment that I I stopped doing the freelance art. I had been kind of beating a dead horse for a couple of years, at least, maybe three. But I'd been doing it for a while. and, And I had some early success such that you know, it seemed like, okay, this is a path I can do. And I liked the work. And But the market kind of changed over that time. In the last several years, it was like, can I keep doing this? Can I, can I accept this degree of uncertainty and frustration in my life, basically? Right. You know, because I liked the work. I liked working with art directors. I liked doing the painting. I liked doing the Photoshop stuff. But it was this uncertainty of, you know, doing a presentation and not knowing if any of the work would go anywhere, especially after 2008. I think things got really tight. Yeah. So the decision to leave that and decide that I was going to just teach workshops and paint, 
I decided I wasn't going to show my work or try to sell my work until I felt solid as a painter until I had some clue as to who I was as a painter. Cause mm-hmm. but yeah, that was this moment of feeling like I just didn't even know who I was or what I was doing as an artist. So I had taught some workshops just now and then in mostly craft kind of processes, making like book binding and making boxes and, you know, some other paper, paper craft type things and some in collage. And so I knew I was comfortable teaching and I was comfortable giving workshops and I just needed to see if I could make a living at it. So deciding that I wasn't going to do the trade shows that I had done as a freelance artist was a big deal. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit more about that when you made that decision, because it's always scary to change something, you know, like if you're comfortable working in a particular way, you have your life, you can kind of, in some ways, predict your life and what's going to happen. Meaning like you're going to these shows, you know what the market is. And then all of a sudden, you just say like, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. Do you remember what you were feeling like and how that was when you initially made the decision and started putting the plan into reality? Yeah, it felt quite freeing. And I guess when I approach tough decisions like that, my method is to try on one way, like, okay, today I'm going to pretend that yes, I'm going to continue with this, this freelance art business or whatever the thing is, and just see how I feel during the day. And it's partly it's like a physical thing. And what's the mental chatter like that day? And what's my anxiety level? And, and then the next day, okay, I'm going to leave this business and do something new. And I don't know what's going to happen and see how that feels. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that just felt like, oh yeah, this is the right decision. And this is good. Yeah. And I knew, I guess, you know, I knew that with the freelance stuff, I had a couple of good ongoing contracts and I knew I would have some royalties for a couple of years that would supplement my income if I could make some money teaching. So, you know, I felt like I had a, a little bit of possibility there. And the cool thing was, I think that first year I sent out six or so proposals for teaching. I just found art centers that I knew about and proposed a weekend workshop or a one day workshop or whatever it was. And I think half of them got accepted and they invited me to teach. And I thought, wow, you know, 50% of my yeah. <laughs> effort gets, gets rewarded like rather than 1%. And so that was a huge, a huge indicator that, oh, this might not be so hard. Right. Just to get the work. And I knew that if I, if I taught, I would get better at teaching because I had done enough teaching to be comfortable starting with it. You know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't a completely new thing. So I just went from there. And that was in, I think, 2009 or 10, 2009, say. And by around, like maybe three or four years later, around 2012-ish, I feel like it was totally on a roll. So it didn't take all that long to really build it up. How did you determine, so for these, when you're approaching these different community centers, did you propose it along with your price or did you let them determine the price? What was that like? Places that didn't have a, a set fee, I gave them a price, a per day price and mileage and whatever. And uh, some places did have a set fee and I just accepted that. And then I think it was 2011, I started doing these, they're called art retreats, like Art and Soul and Art Unraveled. And there's a few others where the promoter gets a, a big convention, hotel convention space, and they might have 10 or 15 workshops going on at the same time and different ones every day or every half day or different ones in the evening. So there's a whole pile of workshops going on by a whole pile of teachers. So I started going to those and it turned out to be a really great way to get new students because I could teach like two one day workshops and two evening workshops. And that's like four workshops in two days. And it might be four different sets of people. So I could really get some traction there. And one of those I still do at, Art and Soul in Portland, just because it's, oh, I just love Portland and I like the gal <laughs> that runs it. <laughs> and, you know, I have kind of a following there. But yeah, I remember one of the ones I did early on there, I I had barely any students, but 
in those types of workshops, you generally have to cover all your own expenses and then they pay you per student. And I calculated it out and it was like I was going to make $200 for being away for most of a week. <laughs> <laughs> like above and beyond all my expenses. Right. And I thought, you know, I can do this. I need the experience. I need to learn how to teach at these things. I'm going to go do it, you know? And so I flew out to Phoenix to do this workshop and, or a couple of workshops, whatever it was. But yeah, there was a time there when I would do whatever teaching gig came my way for whatever they were offering. And I never lost money on one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, I really had had this hunger to learn how to teach and so take all the opportunities I could. And, you know, I certainly made lots of mistakes and ultimately figured out something that's workable for me and for my students. And that's an ongoing process too. you know, every workshop, I learned something about teaching. Yeah. What were some of the bigger mistakes that you made while you were teaching? And then I'll ask you what the what the bigger wins are. So you can, you know, I don't want to focus on that. <laughs> So we can get out of the swamp. Yeah. (laughs) I remember one time I went to Chicago for one of these types of workshops. Someone called it a cafeteria style workshop, which I think is great. You know, where there's a pile of workshops going on all at once. And I wasn't fully prepared. And I had also done two workshops prior to that with just a week in between. And I I have a rule now that, you know, there has to be two weeks between two workshops. I I can't, you know, I burn out. Right. So this was early on. And and I got some bad feedback, I think, on their evaluations such that I was not invited back the next year. And I said, well, you know, tell me what the feedback was, because that'll be really useful. I mean, aside from the fact that I was terribly disappointed. And they said, you know, I had forgot something on the supply list that ended up being crucial and that I didn't seem organized. And it was like one comment from one person out of I might have been doing three or four workshops. Wow. But that hit home. And so from then on for those workshops, I just packed my supplies really in a very organized way. Like these all are for this workshop. and These things are for that workshop and double checked my supply list. And I mean, it doesn't take much for a student to have a not very good experience. And, and then it's not a huge effort on the teacher's part to just get it together. Right. But, you know, and that wasn't like a huge mistake, but I remember feeling like kind of out of my depth in that particular workshop that got criticized that, oh, shoot, I forgot to put this on the list. And so what are we going to do next? And, you know, so I, I'm sure that came across, you know. Right, right. Yeah. When you're trying to improvise because you don't have the right materials for the students or they don't have what they need and you're trying to figure out how to teach it without that. That's. Yeah. And that was totally my fault. On the other hand, when students show up without the materials that I have, I have specified on the list, I'm not all that patient with it. (laughs) Actually, I am, but I've taken to doing this thing now where I do a a pre-workshop email that reminds people of the supply list and the links to the products that they need. And I even have a, what is it? It's a cute, oh, an FAQ sheet. Like here are the most frequently asked questions why don't you read this now so that we don't have to take class time with it? Oh, that's a nice way to phrase it. Yeah, I don't quite phrase it like that. But yeah, like, here's some FAQs, look it over, and (laughs) and you'll have a much better experience. And that matters, they're paying to be there. And I think there's a lot of people that will appreciate that that are that are very organized that are just like, Oh, good. So we can get this out of the way and not have to worry about it. Yeah. And you know, the more prepared my students come, the more we can kind of get into the art making and not have to I don't know, backtrack into things that they could already know before they show up. And most of my workshops are kind of an intermediate level workshop. So they, they're expected to know about materials and, you know, some basic art concepts. And there's some exceptions to that. And, and it doesn't mean that if someone comes in and they don't have that background, they're not welcome. Right. I just like to know that ahead of time so that I can make sure that they're, you know, that they get what they need. Yeah. Then you can just dive in and get to the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. So So on the flip side of that question of the sort of disaster or (laughs) things that didn't go well, that's not a disaster, but things didn't that didn't really go well. What have been some of the more memorable experiences that you've had with your students in those workshops and on a more positive note? I've thought about this. And there's there are just too many to enumerate or to pick out one that's particularly memorable. I mean, I do have 
particularly good groups now and then that seem to have a, a synergy and a kind of collective energy that, that seems to work. But yeah, it's hard to pick. Isn't that funny, though, because you get so many more positive responses. And then the one person that complains, you remember almost, I'm not saying, well, we human beings, not necessarily, remember almost exactly word for word what they said, even if it was 10 years ago, or five years ago, you remember that, but the good ones are like, oh, there's so, you know, there's so many, (laughs) which is wonderful. Well, exactly. And I have to say, I mean, you know, that isn't the one criticism I, I got isn't the only one. But yeah, when someone when someone has a complaint about my workshop, I take it seriously. <laughs> because, you know, if, if there's anything I can do about it, then I will. Yeah. Yeah. The complaints are actually very, very helpful because they show you I mean, uh, hopefully people do it in a in a way that's constructive. But you know, like that, you want to provide a good experience, you want to make everything really good for your students. And so hearing that something's not working is so helpful. I've changed, you know, my own, I've changed so much just based off of small comments that people have made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I I invite that. And I ask students to, in a follow up email that I that I send after classes, I, I ask students to please send feedback if there's anything. And I used to send out like a whole questionnaire, but I didn't get many, I didn't get enough people sending that back to make it worthwhile. So now I just send out an invitation for feedback. Was there, And sometimes I add a few particular questions, but you know, anything that's actionable, mm-hmm. if they think I'm too short, tough. Exactly. <laughs> you know, take a workshop from someone taller. But, you know, most people know what I'm doing by the time they show up at a workshop is because I have a lot of a lot of videos on the, my YouTube channel. And so usually they've kind of seen a lot of that and they've seen how I work. And so it's pretty, a pretty self-selecting group. Mm-hmm. And then occasionally I do get these just fabulous emails from people saying how, you know, a workshop or whatever I was saying changed their lives or whatever. And that's just pretty gratifying. I mean, I, I get that that I am reaching some people. So that's, that's pretty gratifying. That's amazing. Yeah, it feels so as a teacher, it feels so good, because you, it's kind of like you did it, you know, like you set out to create this experience and to teach them something that really, if they get it, then they really are going to put it into practice and, and implement things. And that can have a big impact on their art. And it's, that's like the best ever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing that my students respond to particularly positively is when they see me screwing up. Yeah. And me not knowing what I'm doing and not knowing where I'm going as a painter. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't, or that's not why, but that is kind of another aspect of the fact that I really, I don't know how to make my own paintings. (laughs) Like I don't know how to, I can't reproduce one. When I start a painting, I really don't know what it's going to, turn out like I can't do a step-by-step demo Mm -hmm. and that's true to the way I paint so it's pretty easy to screw up in front of students because that's how I paint (laughs) just I paint and I paint over and then I add something and then paint over that and add something else and paint over that and I mean it's kind of a back and forth process it's not a step-by-step linear one right and I think that's the case for a lot of painters yes yeah I think so too. I think there's some who are formulaic or they, out of necessity, they're teaching a formula just to get a point across. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And I think people can learn from that. I mean, when I talk to students about other, other workshops or if they're talking to me about other workshops they've taken or other teachers they've taken from, you know, I don't want to devalue that kind of teaching, but I really encourage people to take any teaching as a kind of hypothesis and mine and t- as well, you know, take what Jane said or what anyone else said, take it to your studio, try it out, see how it fits into your practice, see if it fits into your practice. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, ultimately you're making it up as you go along your own art practice and coming to something that's, that's you. And it's not going to be me. It's not going to be other teachers. It's, it's going to be your own thing. Right. Right. I equate it sometimes to, trying on clothes or trying on outfits. 
Uh-huh. That, you know, some of them are going to look good and some of them are going to fit or some of them you're like, ooh, I have my own style and I'm going to put my own accessories on it and make that totally different. And yeah. some you're just like, yeah, no, that's just not ever going <laughs> to. That's <Right>. good. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a beautiful piece of fabric. It's everything about it is really lovely, but it's not for me. And that's okay. And you know, like that's trying things on and keeping what works and discarding what doesn't is how you get your voice. Yeah, I think that's true. And then the other thing about finding one's voice, I, I feel like that's just an ongoing process. Because mm-hmm. I think some people, I mean, some people come to my classes saying they want to find their own artistic voice. It's a very common question. Yeah. And from what I can see, they already have it. Like there they are. Look at their work. Yes, I can see their voice. There it is. But they come. Sometimes I get the impression that they believe that once they find that voice, then it'll be easier. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the thing that, I mean, for me in my practice, art is never easy. I can never bang out a painting. If I have a deadline to get paintings done, well, then forget it. I just can't do them. There are some exceptions to that, but it's never easy. I mean, some things get easier, but then the work changes to put me back on an edge or push me forward onto another edge. So, I mean, and that's what keeps, for me, that's what keeps the practice fresh and interesting. And that's, I think, what keeps the work fresh. Yes. So it's that, you know, being comfortable enough with the the difficulty of painting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and being comfortable with not knowing. Exactly. Yeah. Not just comfortable with it, but you know, like at first maybe it's the idea of getting, just get, just being comfortable with the fact that you don't know. And then there's getting excited by the fact that you don't know, because then it's kind of like, what's going to happen next? You know, if I do this, what will happen? Or you have these instincts and you follow them. And maybe logically they make no sense at all, Mm -hmm. but they Mm -hmm. lead you somewhere else. And that's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing I hope that I, I get across when I'm demonstrating, because I really don't know where the demo is going. If I'm demonstrating a painting, (laughs) like if it's just a technique, that's one thing. But, you know, I don't know where it's going. And particularly when there's students around me and I'm kind of, on stage doing that. Mm -hmm. I sort of love that because it pushes me in places I wouldn't necessarily go if I were just in my own studio by myself, you know, because I don't have the time pressure. Like if students are watching and I'm here being the one who's supposed to know what I'm doing, I got to fake it. And so I just put one thing down and another thing down and keep going. And, and that's the kind of mind space I want to be in when I'm in my own studio. But I got to tell you, it's easier when there's people watching, putting pressure on (laughs) That's so interesting. Isn't that funny? Yeah, because I mean, what's interesting for me about that is that I find that it is such a different part of your brain when you have to explain everything you're doing. Yeah. Uh And so I feel like that kind of slows me down or it's almost distracting in a way. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're explaining. Yeah. 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 So sometimes, yeah, when I'm demoing occasionally, not occasionally, here's what... I find is really, or people have told me it's really useful. If what I do is just narrate what's going on in my head as I'm painting. And so it's not explaining, okay, I'm going to take this color and mix it with that color. Cause what I'm really after is this other color. It's just like, okay, yeah, this looks good. Okay, fine. And then I'm just going to do a little pattern with my finger in that color. Oh yeah. That's running into this other color. And oh, that's kind of unexpected. Oh yeah. I just, I guess I'll just let that go. And then I pick up another color and it's just the narrating what's the stuff that's going on in my head, which isn't much explanation. It's just verbalizing it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because then you're saying things more along the lines of I'm going to use this really now I feel like there needs to be saturation here. And I want this to pop. So I'm going to do something really saturated, or I want more contrast or yeah, exactly. And even just like making noises like, ooh, mm, oh, look at that. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And then this part over here, oh, forget that. And then take a big swath of white paint right over it. Whatever. You know, it's it's a lot of just kind of making noises and emoting. And at the same time, if I can, if words make sense, then say the word. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's so funny. 
<laughs> so do you do that? So I want to hear about your process when you're in your studio by yourself. Do you talk to yourself? Do I? Actually, I listen to NPR. I listen to <laughs> National Public Radio. And I find that that degree of distraction is just about right. Because if I'm just by myself in silence, that doesn't work. I need a little bit of distraction. And I find music is too much distraction. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like I'm a musician. And so oh. like if I'm listening to something, I either want to stop painting and go get my ukulele and play or it drives me. I don't like it. And so it's driving me so crazy. I need to turn it off. I can't just tune it out. So yeah, music just has, it just elicits a strong response one way or the other. So that's really interesting. Cause I'm kind of the, op- is it the opposite? I don't know. Music, I can do music, but it has to be a lot of times if it's an album that is in general, like three minute increments, I become really aware of those three minutes. So I need something that's, you know, like classical or jazz or something that's like long form. Because otherwise, I start getting really focused on what the time what the time is. And with audio with them, I listen to books or I listen to podcasts. Uh huh. And that works sometimes. But then sometimes I just get so interested in what they're saying that I I find I'm just standing there holding the paintbrush and not doing anything and listening. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think think we all have to find our own there. The other thing yeah. that I really like is painting with one other person in the studio. And so I make art dates occasionally, but not enough because I'm not in my studio very much. <laughs> I mean, I am sometimes, but it's just hard to coordinate with someone else. And I live out in the sticks. And, you know. Why do you like that? What do you get out of that? Well, if it's the right person, and there's just a couple of people I've done this with, the conversation is enough distraction from the work. So that inner critic stays out of the room. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that stays out of the room is the kind of the inclination to stop and take a break when it's not going well, or when I don't know what to do next. You know, I can always go check my email or, you know, get caught up in an online class or, you know, but if someone's there, I keep going. Yep. And so it's both those things. It gives me that little bit of distraction And then also just the necessity of staying in the room and painting when it gets hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the other thing is just another pair of eyes Mm -hmm. on my work. I have this one woman, we, we work in really small format when we work together and we just routinely hold up our work to each other. And okay, what do you think of that? What about that? What about that? And I find that's really valuable. I mean, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're painting to the other person's taste. It's just having another pair of eyes on the work. Yeah. You know, as it's in process, which is sort of different than people looking at the work when it's finished. Yeah, that's so interesting. What, I'm just thinking about this, that when I, I used to work at Disney, when I worked there, sometimes I would have to work, I would have to, or I would, or whatever, one of the two, work late at night. And it was always so much easier when there was another art director there that was also on deadline. There was something about just not being the only person there. And also now I have, I have my real friends, I have my online friends. And when I'm writing or doing something like that, we do this thing called it's we call it shut up and work. And we're just Uh on Skype together, not talking, Uh both computers are muted and just writing for like an hour or getting like the business work done or getting like that stuff done. And there is something really weird about (laughs) Having another person either really oh, in the room with you, <laughs> it's so helpful. And I don't know, like, I will, just knowing that somebody's there, I don't get distracted by emails or anything. I shut everything down and I'm hyper-focused for one hour and then we'll just kind of like wave or, you know, sometimes, you know, because we're both writing, we'll ask each other questions about it and like, you know, hey, what do you think of this? Kind of exactly what you're saying. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant because I find I find working in my studio alone actually pretty challenging. I mean, I do it and I enjoy it. I you know, I go up to my studio and it's like, "Oh, good." But there's some challenges and I think having people around a little bit more often would be nice. And one project I have going on, I don't know if it's going to start this year or next year, but I'm building a new studio. How exciting. Yeah, I'm so excited. I can hardly stand it. Oh my God, I would be going through the roof. Did you get to design it yourself? Well, actually, my husband's an architect. Ah. Yeah. 
And I just gave him a list of the requirements and the square footage I wanted. And, you know, I need these, I need wall space, but I also need natural light, all this stuff. And I mean, the main challenge of my current studio is that it's, it's in a separate building that doesn't have running water. So, and it's upstairs. So if I have to use the bathroom, I have to like leave the studio, come into the house, all that, you know, Mm -hmm. I can't wash brushes out there, you know, and also it's under a gable roof. So it just has knee walls on two sides and then gable walls on the two ends. And so the usable square footage is not great. Yeah. 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 So I gave him a list of the stuff I needed and one of them being running water. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you're so demanding, Jane. (laughs) Yeah. But I want high ceilings and so forth. Anyways, and he works kind of slowly and methodically, but he's really thorough and he comes up with he just came up with a terrific design that that looks great attached to the house. And I didn't really mean it to be attached to the house at first, but then we explored that option. Actually, in his role as the zoning administrator of our town, he required that. Oh, isn't that handy? <laughs> yeah, so the joke is that I'm sleeping with both the zoning administrator and the architect. <laughs> well played, Jay. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, so he came up with this design that looks great attached to the house. It doesn't look like just like an added on rectangle. So there's a little kind of connection and there's a little porch on the front and a loft over part of it. And I'm going to stand up in the loft and drop paint onto canvases and watch it splatter. Oh my God, how fun. Yeah. But the nice thing about it is it will, it will have room for several people to work. So I hope to have like small mentoring workshops and also just have art dates and just, you know, have artists over to work with me. Mm -hmm. And there's enough artists kind of in driving distance that we could do that kind of reciprocally. So I just hope to work with people more often once I have my new studio. So fun. I love it. That sounds so great. (laughs) Yes. You know what I wanted to ask you earlier and I didn't, I'm just kind of curious, what made you decide to write a book? Oh, this last book that I did? Well, when you first, like your first book that you wrote. So you're, you're working away in your studio. And what made you decide I'm going to write a book? Oh, the first book was this book on ceramics. And that came out in a pretty linear kind of way, (laughs) or easy to explain, I should say. Someone who's a, she designed and manufactured home furnishings, Susan Sargent. And she lived, I don't know if she still lives, lived in this area. And she came over to borrow some pottery for a photo shoot. And then her editor wanted to meet me or something because I was going to be in New York at this trade show that I did for the freelance stuff. And she said, it was the editor who said, would you like to write a book? I thought, oh, you mean about ceramics? Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> so that was my first book. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy, but it's like I, I started kind of cataloging my knowledge about ceramics. And I had considerable knowledge about ceramics because I had a an academic background in ceramics. And then I was also working in this paint your own pottery hobby style. And so I thought, oh, I could take my kind of knowledge of materials and present it to people that may want to do this painted pottery as a hobby. Because like when people just read the labels of the materials and see how to use them and just use them according to that, you just get pretty boring stuff. Right. And I knew that you could use them in all these different ways because I kind of had an idea of what happens in the kiln and, and I could test a whole bunch of stuff and it would just be fun. So it was. And so after that, I wrote two more books while I was doing the freelance art. And that was with the same publisher, Watson Guptill. Or maybe it was three more books. <laughs> You've lost track. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to sound like that, but I just, I just needed a project, you know, that sort of meant more to me than, than yes. doing freelance work that wasn't going anywhere. And then this last book that I wrote, I mean, I really said about five, like when I decided I was going to teach and I wasn't going to do freelance work anymore, I also said, and I'm not writing any more books. (laughs) And that obviously didn't turn out well for you, did it? (laughs) No, but this book, I felt like (laughs) this one that I just published last June called The Elements of Visual Language. I really felt with the teaching experience I had, I really had a handle on a bunch of stuff that my students need to hear. Mm -hmm. or need to read, or they need in a format that they can take with them. Like, these are my notes from my teaching of the last seven years, or Mm -hmm. 
here's kind of a good review for the class you just took with me. Because I found myself saying some of the same things over and over again that seemed to resonate. Yeah. So it was going to be a lot bigger. And then at some point during the process, I decided to divide it in two. And so this is just part one of what I originally wanted to write. But I did decide that I wasn't writing another book for a publisher. So I self-published this, which was so much fun. So tell me about that. Why did you make that decision and why was it more fun? Well, actually, I was asked by the acquisitions editor who had acquired my previous books for Watson Guptill. She had asked, she's with a different publisher now because Watson Guptill doesn't exist. And she had kind of inquired about whether I was interested in doing another book a few years ago. And I said, well, not really, but maybe I don't really have time, but why don't we do a proposal? And so we did a proposal. We, meaning she did most of it because I just didn't have time. (laughs) And she pitched it to the publisher and the publisher said no. And the reason was that my previous books hadn't sold, you know, really well. I mean, they sold well enough, but they didn't sell particularly well. But I wasn't really out teaching when I did those. And I didn't have this following that I seem to have now. So that was one thing. Like I was going to have to prove to someone that I have a following. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was during coming up with the outline for the book, I kept feeling like slightly pushed away from what I wanted to say because it has to reach a larger market. And I had felt that in the previous books, but I was okay with that because I felt like, yeah, I mean, the editor is, it's fine if I want her input on how it's going to reach a larger larger audience. But this book felt more like, okay, I don't need to reach a big audience. I can just reach the people that I'm talking to, which is people that come to my workshops. And here's the stuff I want to say. And I don't want to dumb it down to make it accessible to, to a wider audience. I don't want to pretend that painting is quick and easy. You know? (laughs) Yeah. You don't want to do the three easy steps to make a masterpiece painting. Exactly. It's, I, you know, I joke with my students, I joked with my students about writing a book called the agony of what's the opposite of quick and easy, the long, slow agony of painting or something, <laughs> the, the frustration. Of painting. I mean, obviously it's not all frustration and agony or we wouldn't do it. I think it's worth doing and it's su- super rewarding, but making somebody else's painting from a step-by-step process is quick and easy, but I don't get any reward for that. Right. Right. And I've tried it. I've looked at these how-to books and I've picked out projects and just done them to see what's the takeaway. What do I get from this? Oh, so you went and followed like their exact, so you painted the thing that they said. Yeah. I've done that on occasion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just in, in kind of researching teaching, like I don't want to just totally bad mouth that because there might be something really valuable in that. And I think for people who need to learn techniques or they just need to get their hands in the paint. Yeah, I think that it's a good, I don't know, it's difficult because it's almost a double-edged sword because you kind of need to show people those things so that they can get, it's getting comfortable with the materials and also really understanding, you know, like basic foundational things like values and mixing colors, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, that can be formulaic and and you want them to have a good outcome so that they're encouraged and not just Mm -hmm. like, oh, this is horrible. So that's when formulas are useful. But the problem is that sometimes people think there's a formula then for everything and that there's a secret that somebody else knows that they don't. And if they just knew that secret. Yeah. Then painting would be easy, uh which it's not. Right. (laughs) But Yeah, in fact, I got an inquiry. I get these occasionally from people who are beginners. And they're saying, you know, which one of your workshops, like I have these downloadable workshops and stuff. I say, which one of your workshops would you recommend? Or or I want to take one of your workshops, but I need to get some experience. And what do you recommend? And I never recommend my workshops. (laughs) I mean, I sent someone to Carla Sondheim's website because she has a whole bunch of online workshops that are given by a whole bunch of different teachers. And I said to this woman, here, here's a couple that look good to me. This one is like painting flowers. And this one is oh, something else. But they were very much focused and finite and not formulaic, not here's how to make a good flower, but a bunch of different ways to make flowers in paint. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, just get some painting under your belt. Get out your paints and paint with them. And so here's some things that could give you some direction. 
And she did. And she got back to me saying that was just perfect, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, I think at that level, when you're a beginner and you just need to get some practice with pace, I think that's a really good time to just follow a formula. So you're not trying to create your own art at the same time that you're trying, that you're struggling with materials. Mm -hmm. You're doing your musical chords. You're doing your scales. You're you're playing other people's songs exactly the way they play them. Yeah. Yeah. There's absolute value in that. I don't know how many sergeants I painted when I was in school and I loved it. Yeah. You learn from that. And so that's, you know, that's why I wanted to kind of do that out of books to see what the thing is. But I think it's, you know, beyond that beginner level, you just need to push yourself Mm -hmm. unless you just want to make pretty paintings that look like someone else's, in which case that can work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think people get comfortable doing that. I don't, I don't believe that's what they want, you know? Yeah. Like I think they're just, and this isn't a criticism or a judgment, but it's scary to show yourself in your work. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so sometimes it's more fun to sort of put a costume on and be somebody else, you know? (laughs) Oh, that's interesting. That is a really interesting way of thinking about it. Because you're right. It is sort of hiding behind an accepted norm. Mm -hmm. But then again, you see these, I wonder about this, you see sort of styles that emerge that you see among the works of a whole bunch of different artists. Uh And I don't know how, like, are they influenced by each other? Is one of them a pioneer and the others are all hiding behind a costume? Is it something in the culture that's being expressed by different people in a, in a similar way? You know, I don't know what that is. I think there's a range. I honestly think there's a range. I think there's always going to be, you know, sort of the pioneer where that's just, they're thinking on a whole other level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have people who that resonates with them and they're exploring it. Mm-hmm. And they're using that to get to another place. And then there's other people that are just copying it. So in a way, I'm, I'm just sticking, you know what, Jade, I'm sticking with the musical analogies today. Let's do it. It's like you've got somebody who's, you know, composing this amazing thing on one end of the spectrum. On the far end of the opposite spectrum, you have cover bands. Uh-huh. And then in between, you have people who are genuinely interested and are being influenced that and they're taking those riffs and they're creating something completely new with it. Yeah. No, I think in probably all art forms, you're getting that kind of range. Yeah. But it's interesting to see things emerging kind of culturally because we do have kind of cultural connections. And I know you're in the other side of the world. You're in Argentina, right? No, we moved back. Oh yeah. We moved to California. I'm in, I'm in the States now. (laughs) Okay. Are you away from the fires? I am. I'm on the other side of the Sierras. Thank goodness. But yeah, there's a lot of people over there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think things emerge kind of culturally. And it'll be interesting to see how work that's done today that might be very current, you know, which work sort of survives and which looks dated. Mm -hmm. That will be very interesting to see. Because there's so much that we're experiencing now that nobody has ever experienced before, like, you know, the internet and the influence of certain movies and and new technologies that allow us to see differently. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like, in a way, The Matrix and (laughs) as amazingly old as that movie is now, it's making me feel Mm -hmm. old. But you know, that really changed cinematography. And that really also changed, I think, how people see things. So this kind of like fractured pieces of images that comes out of that and that was then Mm -hmm. you know people took it and ran with it and created something totally different I think that is a reaction to the culture and things that nobody had ever seen before and that made them think of something else and then they created their own thing out of it and then there's going to be some that who's that I'm blanking now who was that artist extremely famous in the 80s and he did the he would do these portraits of women they were like It's just so 1980s and you see it, you see like ripoffs or not ripoffs of it, but you'll see that on hair salons a lot. Like for some reason, it's in hair salons. (laughs) No, I can't think of the artist you're talking about. It's so funny. But yeah, so he, I think, has just, you know, become extraordinarily dated and like you see Uh see that work and it's 1980. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, but it was an expression of its time. Yeah. 
It was. I think there's as much value in that as, as, well, I don't know, works that are more transcendent that kind of have a timelessness about them. I mean, we need both. Yeah, we do. But it'll be interesting to see what, you know, if we have a chance to look back at this time. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) But anyways, one thing I would really like to do, Ness, because of our conversation about, about what do you listen to, like I do this thing in workshops occasionally where I have people paint to music. Mm-hmm. And so I have these playlists that are like three to four minute segments of very contrasting music. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So they're very carefully chosen bits of music that are hugely various in style. And just, it's not to like see if everyone makes the same painting to this music or, you know, or how it changes from piece of music to piece of music. It's just a way to get people loosened up. Mm -hmm. And it does that. But I'm wondering if I listened to sort of long format music in my studio, like what if I played a 10 10 or 12 minute piece and just played it over and over again for an hour? Oh, it turns it. I can. Well, I'll tell you what happened with me. It turns into like Pavlov's dog in a way. Like I have a Bach album that I would, I don't know. It was like first thing in the morning. That's what I would listen to. And then I would start going and then I would start, you know, I would start painting or start doing something. And then I I guess I stopped listening to it for a long time. And then I put it on again and I wasn't painting and I was like, I need to paint now. Wow. Maybe that's a good thing. It is. I think it, I think it really is. Yeah. There's a couple albums that are like that for me and I will purposely like change things up. Like sometimes I'll take advantage of that three minute thing and play like kind of hard rock or, you know, something really energetic when I'm doing something that needs to be done quickly and that needs energy. And then when I need to be more thoughtful and more careful, then it's calmer music and more long form. Hmm. Yeah. I got to experiment with that. Or an audio book. I can look at some paintings and go, oh my gosh, I was listening to Neil Gaiman when I painted that. And I remember like, I'll be looking at a very specific place in the painting and I'll remember a part of the story. Oh, I do that too. Or I used to do that more when I was doing the freelance work because some passages were like long, tedious pieces of painting. Yeah. And I'd be listening to books on tape. Yeah. Yeah. And even walls, I look at a wall that I painted. I mean, just... I do like I've done some interior painting in my own house and I look at the wall and I remember what I was listening to in the passage of the book on tape that I was listening to yeah. I was doing that particular trim piece. I know that's crazy, isn't it? And I have a, I did this one painting that was super, super intricate and I was living in this place that had no air conditioning and it was summer. So it was like 110 degrees. It was so hot and I'm painting this thing. And I just remember I was binging on Radio Lab. Do you, you ever listen to that? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was on a full on Radio Lab binge and uh-huh. painting this super, super intricate thing and it was like hundred and ten degrees and that was the only thing that kept me sane. And so like I look at that and I'm like, Oh yeah, they were talking about time travel when I was painting that corner and yeah, when I was doing that part of his jeans, that was this that was the episode on, you know, like laughter or wow. whatever it was. So insane. Yeah, I love that the way the the visual stuff really connects to your memories of your audio memory, I guess it is. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, who knows? Huh? Brain is amazing. So I want to ask you one last question to wrap this up and then I'll let you go back to your studio. What habit do you have that you feel like contributes most to your either success or your growth as an artist? I think just painting as frequently as possible and not having the goal of painting something good. (laughs) I mean, I really, that's one thing that I stress to my students because it's the one thing that I think keeps me going. If I go to the studio and I think I have to like finish this painting or I have to make this good, then it's just discouraging. But if I go to the studio and just say, I've got an hour or I've got half an hour or I've got three hours, I'm just going to make marks. I'm going to, like if I, unless I'm in the middle of something and I kind of know what I'm doing, but just always being open to what happens and not putting the pressure on myself to be good at it or to finish it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's it. It's, it's more a habit of mind. It's not, I mean, also, you know, going to the studio as frequently as possible, which sometimes just isn't that frequently, but yeah, it's a habit of mind of of going and not feeling the pressure to be good at it. Mm, I love it. Yeah. That's really good. That it's kind of, keeping the inner critic outside for while you're painting. Like I always feel like there's this, while you're painting, you need to be open and creative and you can't be judgmental 
Otherwise, you kind of lose it. Yeah. And then later on, you can come back and look at it and be judgmental and be like, okay, is this working? Is this not? Yeah. You can edit. Yes. Constructive criticism, but you can't paint and edit at the same time. Yeah, that's that's kind of key. And the other thing, just my, I think it's a studio habit. Go into the studio and as frequently as I can. And sometimes I really, if I have just a half an hour or, you know, a short amount of time to still go and just gesso some panels or yes, do something. Because, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I guess I just think any time spent in the studio is, is valuable time if I'm just doing something. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I often encourage my students to come to the studio without a goal that's like a finished thing or a goal of doing a good thing, that just doing a thing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) just make something, make some marks, put some paint on paper. And, you know, if you're feeling really crappy, if I'm feeling really like, if I've been away teaching for too long and haven't been in the studio for a while, I really just try to go and I take cheap drawing paper and craft paint and just put some marks on the paper, not try to make something or try to make part of something or start something just put some marks on some paper Mm -hmm. and that, that helps just get into, you know, back into the materials in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll find that you'll start moving or you'll start painting something or it just like kind of gives you a little bit of, I don't know, like that boost or that feeling like when that you've played with color and you painted anything. Exactly. Yeah. It just kind of greases the wheels. And then like maybe the next day it'll, I'll feel a little less rusty. Yeah. And it doesn't have to happen that day. Yeah, it might something might come up and take over, but if it doesn't, that's okay. Yeah. Because I think it does have a kind of cumulative effect, just putting in the hours, putting in the time, and it doesn't all have to be productive in, in the ways that we're habitually thinking of being productive, that it's all productive time. So I guess that would be it. Jane, thank you very much. That was a wonderful conversation, and I really enjoyed getting to know you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and really nice to get to know you a little bit. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Show notes for this episode are on SavvyPainter.com. Just click on the podcast tab to see some of Jane's paintings, and you can also get links to connect with her. For the past three years, just about every week, I have been working hard to bring you tips and techniques to help you out in your studio, in-depth interviews with artists who are gracious enough to share their stories. And by sharing their stories, they show the rest of us that we are not alone. Each of us has a role to play in this community. So now I just want to take a moment of gratitude to thank some very special people in our community. Julie Mann, thank you so much for your generosity and your lovely note. Maureen Nathan, Susie Zefting Kuhn, Margaret Serena, Joanna Hernandez, Karen O'Connell, Teresa Hill, Alchemy Works, Jeanette Gray, Kathleen Calhoun, Christine Curtin, Jill Opelka, ZB Gallery, Laura Wolstenholme, Robert Talbert, Gabrielle McDermott, Elizabeth Quinn Bolduck, Right Design, Andy Doby, Srivana Nara, and Ji Young Kim Studio. Thank you so much for your support of this podcast. I really appreciate it. One more thing I want to let you know this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists push through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. 
and you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 